So what we want to do is thinking about um, testing the stability of the equilibrium that we derive. And we're going to do this by doing something called a perturbation analysis. And conceptually, what we're thinking about is if we think about our value of p, and that value can go from 0 to 1, and if we do a derivation and we get some sort of equilibrium value of p that we're able to derive, the question is, that equilibrium, if I perturb it, if I make it a little bit bigger and change it to this value, or I make it a little bit smaller and change it to this value, that's kind of conceptually equivalent to having our kind of ball, having our ball, and nudging it one way or another, nudging it one way or another. The question is, in our system here, if I nudge it, does it kind of keep going off like it's unstable? Or if I nudge it below, does it keep going off like it's unstable in this situation? Or when I nudge it, does it go back? So does it go back like this? So what we're interested in is when we have an equilibrium frequency, if we make it a little bit bigger, maybe due to random chance or something happens, will it return? If we make it smaller, will it return? If it returns both from both directions, this will be a stable equilibrium. If, on the other hand, a nudge kind of sends it off, then that equilibrium would be unstable. So what we want to do, and the way we mathematically do it, is we'll ask the following questions. Is delta p positive for some value of p that's equal to the equilibrium minus some small number? That's what this epsilon means. And is delta p negative for some value of p, which is the equilibrium value plus some small amount, right? So this like little amount we're changing it is the epsilons. If this is true, and this is true, both of them together, then we know that the equilibrium is stable. Otherwise, right, if either of them is untrue, then the equilibrium is unstable. So this is the analysis we want to do. We want to take our equation that we have from before, our delta p equation, plug in this, solve for the sine of delta p, and see whether we get this result and this result, or whether we get some other sort of alternative. So let's look at that using the example that we just derived for overdominance. So for the overdominance equation, we're going to think about, okay, what if p is equal to the equilibrium minus epsilon? So we had our delta p equation. This is from before, s p q over w bar, 1 minus 2 p, s p q w bar, substituting in. Now we actually know what this equilibrium frequency was, right? We already derived this earlier. We know that this thing was 1 half, right? That was our equilibrium frequency. So we can substitute that in, S, P, W bar, 1 minus 2 times 1 half minus epsilon. Now multiplying through, S, P, Q, W bar, 1 minus 2 times a half is 1, and then negative 2, negative epsilon, we would get this. Those cancel. So now we have S P Q W bar times 2 epsilon. This is positive. This is positive, this is positive, this is positive. Our epsilon was a positive value that we subtracted, so this whole thing is positive. So that represents the situation where if we have this equilibrium frequency here, 
if we examine, if we make a perturbation here to look at the frequency of p hat minus epsilon, our delta p is positive, which means we have a return. But that's only one side of our system. We need to think about the other side as well. So let's think about what happens when the frequency is equilibrium frequency plus epsilon, delta p, s, p, q, w bar, 1 minus 2p, s, p, q, w bar, 1 minus 2, equilibrium plus epsilon. We have our result from before, that p hat was equal to 1 half. one minus two, a half, a half, plus epsilon. Two and a half is one, negative two epsilon. S, P, Q w bar, negative 2 epsilon. That's positive, that's positive, that's positive, that's positive, all multiplied by something that's negative, gives us this. So that means if we have an equilibrium frequency here, and we have a perturbation to increase it to this frequency here, what happens? Delta p is negative, which means that frequency will come back down to that equilibrium. So in this case, for the overdominance case that we looked at and derived our results for, the equilibrium is stable. Because we tested it in both directions and saw it returned. Um, not all equilibrium are stable, sometimes they are unstable, it's only by doing a perturbation analysis like this that you're able to determine that. And perturbation analyses are used in a number of other circumstances as well. So for example, similar sorts of growth equations and change equations are used in wildlife management and conservation biology. And when a individual is trying to manage a population and they have these equations, if a population gets to an equilibrium, they may be interested in whether this equilibrium is stable or unstable. If the equilibrium is stable, that means that maybe some individuals could be removed from that population, maybe by allowing hunting permits, and the population would return back to that equilibrium. Whereas if this equilibrium is unstable, uh, would not want to issue hunting permits because that might cause the population to careen off into some other system, uh, maybe and go extinct. So in that there are lots of economic pressures on government officials to allow hunting, they use techniques like this to determine whether or not hunting can happen in a population. And so we're introducing perturbation analysis in this course to study the stability of allele frequencies in populations. Um, one of the reasons I do that in this course is because this technique of solving for an equilibrium and then testing its stability in order to figure out how stable the system is or whether perturbations can be allowed is a major technique that's used across a number of different fields in biology, in particular ecological and conservation management applications.